Uh, so seeing the presence of a quorum, uh, I call to order this meeting of the Amherst Pelham Regional School Committee at 6.34 p.m. Uh, the meeting is being taped and is not being broadcast live. I believe it will be broadcast at a later date, uh, and uh, people should look forward to that. Um, what I would like to do with, uh, so we'll, we'll take announcements and public comments, but what I'd like to do otherwise with the committee's um, approval is move up the superintendent's update. So I'd like to reorder it so that I've been called to order. I'd like actually like to move to announce the public comments, then superintendent's update, and then resume the regular agenda, just out of respect for the public and the timeliness of the superintendent's update. Is that OK? So seeing no objections, so ordered. Uh, so uh, we have an, we're, uh, oh, announcements and public comments. Are there any announcements from the committee? Seeing none, uh, you can, if you think of something, you can raise your hand later. Um, I'd like to open up public comment. Uh, if you have a public comment, uh, please come forward to the microphone and uh, please state your name for the record and you'll have up to three minutes to speak. Uh, don't, don't mind the counter, but it just gives a transparency around uh, the time that's left. So and anyone who'd like to come forward, uh, please feel free to. Hi. I'm Lisa Kane. I live on 1310 Southeast Street. I have two kids in the system, uh, Ruby, she's a freshman in the high school, and my son Alex, who's a seventh grader. I know Allison and a few of you, but um, I brought a visual aid, uh, so I'm just going to demonstrate. My kid plays field hockey. She started a freshman. Um, so the field hockey stick, this is the ball. It moves beautifully. That's actually not a field hockey ball, but it be moves beautifully across the carpet. And, and unfortunately for the for sport of field hockey, um, that's the kind of surface we're supposed to be playing on, a very flat, short room surface. And right now, I don't know if you've been out there, but try that on the field. Try that last fall on the field. The ball didn't go anywhere. And our kids basically couldn't play the sport. And that's when I got involved. And a group of parents met with Rich Farrow in November to talk about the field. He said he didn't have money to update the field. So we could work on it, we could try to help maintain it, we thought about it, whatever. Then what happened, the MS Ultimate Tournament came along, they played on wet fields on Sunday, the fields are a mess. I mean a mess. And um, my job as Ruby's parent is to keep her safe. And the situation has gone way past whether that ball can roll across the field. The situation has gotten too unsafe for kids to play on the fields. Their ankles will twist. I paid, I've played ultimate for 10 years. And I've played on crappy fields and my ankles all over the place and it hurts. And you end up in a boot. And kids have ended up in boots on our fields. And like the smallest thing that this committee can do and the school system can do is keep our kids safe, and that has not been done here. Now, I am, would like to be part of the solution. I will raise money, I will mow, I will seed, I will do whatever, but I've been told I can't go on the fields because of union contract. So, so I know that there's other people who've been trying to work this out. I've been working with them to try to make a difference here. Um, basically, you guys can make a difference by making it a priority, which I see that you've done by putting it on the agenda. But also, not only can you, th if you had money to put toward it, that would be great to help maintain them, but then afterwards, somebody has to say, no, you can't play when it's raining. No, you need to get off the fields so they can come back. And it has to happen all year round. LSSE wants to play um, a lacrosse camp on those fields. It's not safe for them. And until it is safe, we shouldn't have people on them, and you can't throw money at it, you also need to maintain it. And none of this is happening. So I'm deeply frustrated, and I really, really hope you take a good look at this and try your best to make a difference. Because 2022 is when things are supposed to happen, but my kid graduates in 2022. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Amy Sweeting. I live on North Whitney Street. Um, I have a daughter who's also a freshman, Sophie, um, who also plays field hockey and has been playing since seventh grade. I'm just here as um, support to echo everything that Lisa says, and I also just want to give you a little anecdote to show the level of desperation among parents. My husband, not this season, but the previous season when they were playing at the middle school and the fields were a disaster, 
the, the grass was so long you couldn't play field hockey on it. So he went out several Saturdays in a row with the coach, with his tractor, and mowed the field. They didn't have any way to pick up the grass, so then the coach and her son were out there ba- raking and bagging all the grass. And, then they were, and it made it a lot better for the kids to play. But then they were told they couldn't do that because of liability concerns. I think he's... He's unfortunately out of town, so he can't speak to this. But he told me that he was told that if, if somebody got hurt on the field and he had mowed the field, he could get sued. So then, of course, he stopped doing it and didn't want to do it anymore because we don't want that to happen. But anyway, I just wanted you to just, just an example of parents are willing to help and we're, we're willing to do whatever we can, but we, we can't for various reasons. So just know that we are a resource and we're here and want to do something because my kid graduates in 2022, too, and probably will never see the turf field. Thank you. Thank you. We welcome more comments. I'm Matt Kane. I'm Lisa's husband. My daughter played field hockey. I played field hockey when I was in high school. I also was part of the MSU Soccer Association until recently, and I was in charge of the fields there. And I just want to emphasize there's, 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 there's the committee uh, that's been planning on the capital project, but the capital project is kind of one thing. But unless you actually maintain the fields, um, you, you're not going to get the full benefit of that. And the maintenance should have been happening currently, but can definitely start now and go forward. And some of the things that are part of the maintenance, as Lisa said, you know, just keeping an eye, being aware, and fixing issues before they get bad. For example, the main field behind Fort River, which is not exactly relevant here maybe, but um, a few years ago that was the best field in town but it's been overused spring and fall, and now it's been, uh, grass is gone, it's been compacted, and it's in a pretty seriously bad shape right now. So that's because no one's out there making, sh- keeping tabs, there's no like central point of command, moving, moving the usage around, moving fields around. Part of AYSA, we wouldn't put the fields in the same location spring and fall. We would rotate them, we would move them. Even if you, you know, the the space here at the high school is a bit restricted, but you can still move the field 20 yards to the side, 20 yards to the other side, and that will spread the usage out. Um, Also, for example, um, it's unfortunate, Ultimate, you know, they can play on not so great fields, I mean, it's not great for the ankles, but there's not a ball rolling on the ground. Some of the other sports like soccer and uh, especially field hockey really do need that smoother field. And uh, someone needs to be aware of that to try and keep a a good space for the sports that really need it. Okay, so yeah, sort of someone, we we really need someone who's going to keep an eye on all those fields and we need the maintenance budget to do things like seeding, aerating, um, fertilizing, filling in holes, not just mowing, uh, which the mowing is being done, but the other things are not being done. And they need to be done, you know, to catch up probably at least once a year, probably maybe twice a year. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. We welcome further comments. And I should say on this or any other issue somebody wants to address, of course. Um, I come from it from a different perspective. My name is Michael Rudd. I am the boys soccer coach at the high school. Um, This will be my eighth year. I'm also um, the dean of instruction at a charter school in Springfield where I've also been a teacher for several years and I've been an educator now for 20 years. So when I look at the fields, when I think of it from a coaching perspective and a teaching perspective, I think of the overall experience of a student, and that this is an issue of equity. How do we give a student the experience that he and she deserve? Um, Our program has been one of the most successful over the last several years. Whether I'd be the coach or not, we'd still be one of the most successful. I'm certainly not patting myself on the back. But the reality is that we play a style of soccer now that is unrecognizable to me, the coach because we train to do one thing, but we can't do what we want to do because of the conditions of the field. As you know, I wrote a note, I wrote a letter um, in October because I'd had enough. The fields were unplayable, completely unsafe. 
I've seen him at the best of times in August being a hazard for both boys and girls. I have once saw uh, in preseason a few years ago when the field's actually in better shape than they are now, I saw a girl break her ankle. A boy lost his entire season from an injury two preseasons ago, all because of it was non-contact. It was all the, the field itself. Even when we won the Western Mass Championship a couple of years ago, we had nine injuries. Can I attribute them all to the field? No, I'm not, I'm not going to exaggerate that. But it certainly plays a role. And then where do we practice when the field's completely underwater, where it's muddy, when the football field's muddy? We have to pull off of the football field. So this is a program, the boys' team has 80 boys. If you do the math, that's a very high percentage of the boys of the school who try to get on into this program. Girls, it's always between 40 and 50. So you're talking about a large percentage of the student body, a sizable percentage of the student body, who are affected by these fields, who, walk, who go onto those fields and at any moment um, they could slip. I've seen concussions happen because kids have lost their balance on the field and slammed into some other kid or slammed into the ground. I've seen this happen. So I'm asking you, in my 25 seconds, to come up with some kind of plan where we can manage these fields, where we can keep people off them. As somebody else said before, there's a lacrosse camp every summer out there. The fields need to be managed now so that they're playable uh, in the fall. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to echo a lot of what my coach just said. I'm a current junior at the high school. Um, next year, I'm going to be a captain on the team. Um, and I've been fortunate enough throughout my the, the last few years to uh, travel the world playing soccer uh, on some of the best fields with some of the best teams in the world, uh, partly because I'm really good, but also partly because I come from a place of privilege where I've been able to go on those trips and to play on those fields and to play that high-level soccer. And I can really say that that part of my life has contributed greatly to my education as a holistic person and I think that it should, that that opportunity shouldn't just be limited to people like me that come who come from a place of privilege. And I think my understanding of the public school system is that it's supposed to be a place uh, of equality and equity and a mechanism that mediates the uh, discrepancies that are intrinsic in our society. Um, and I don't see that happening with the current way that athletics are being managed at Amherst Regional Public Schools um, because I think there's a perception, uh, I'm speaking from a student, from a student's perspective, that athletics aren't really cared about here. Um, and I know that we're a school district that really prides ourselves on academics and that's great. I, you know, I love, I love coming to school, I love learning. I think a lot, this, this school is a great school. But athletics and the athletic experience is a huge part of learning as an individual because the, you don't go into life and sit in a classroom. You go into life and you work in teams. You solve problems, and part of that you learn playing sports in a safe environment where you can really uh, fulfill your athletic potential. And, again, that shouldn't just be limited to people who come from places of privilege. That should be the public school should be a place where anyone can come and fulfill their athletic potential safely and with the support of the administrators and coaches around them and their facilities. Thanks. Thank you. And don't forget to identify yourself when you come forward. I'm Stuart Schulman. Uh, that was my boy. Obviously, you educated him well. Uh, he speaks and thinks and writes beautifully, thanks to the teachers he loves, the school system he loves. Um, I seriously think about not letting him play on those fields <laughs> because he's got college offer, break an ankle. He could lose a lot of opportunity. As he said, he's already got a lot of opportunity because of who he is and what he is. Um, but the reason I'm here, I don't know if I, do you take documents? Sure. If you have one copy, we can, we'll copy it later and share it with yeah, the committee. Yeah, I can send you electronic. 
So I've been doing a little digging around to try and figure out why hockey players and baseball players are treated differently in this town than everybody else. I haven't done the math exactly, but it seems like it's because they're white boys. That's not a good look for Amherst. So Amherst takes care of baseball players and hockey players really well. Down the totem pole are soccer players, not very far, but down, and football players. But at the bottom are sports dominated by girls. All right, so you have a problem of gender discrimination in your school system, which I think creates vulnerability to lawsuits and challenges about the legitimacy of the school system from the point of view of gender equality. I think you need to immediately address the fact that girls are put on the worst fields that get the worst maintenance and have the worst conditions. Even if you don't do a damn thing for soccer players, you should fix what's happening to girls because from what I heard, this is something that gets talked about. Why are we treated as second class citizens? Because we're girls and play girl sports. Or why are we treated as second class citizens? Because we're not white boys. These are things that get talked about in your schools by your students. And the connection to fields and safety and responsibility, I want to echo everything everybody said. Somebody needs to be in charge. I've talked to a lot of people lately. I, I was with Guilford today. He's the director, he's the super, superintendent of public works. We had a nice chat. It's interesting because Liam started playing soccer down at Fort River, which is a disaster zone. It's like, like a war zone down there. And I asked for a couple extra minutes because I have a good story to tell about Fort, Fort River, if you have the Maybe time. 30 seconds, 30 a minute, seconds 30, 30 seconds. Great, thanks. Okay. Um, I coach down there right with the Capacidad kids now, three days a week. I don't take them outside. We, we play in the gym where it's dangerous because there's objects in the gym that can't be moved away. So when I talked to Guilford about Amherst Youth Soccer and the little place that they play as you drive into the Fort River driveway on your right, it's where all the littlest kids start their soccer career in Amherst. The day it's mowed by Public Works, it's, it's still up to your shins. I went down the day before the first day of soccer for little tiny children, four, five, and six years old. The grass was not only long enough to stop a ball from rolling, there were sharp sticks in the grass. There were holes in the grass. There was a hole big enough to put four cones in the grass, and they were going to play a game there. And I came down with my mower and my rake, like somebody else in this town, and against, like, snuck onto the field. I didn't have a kid playing. I'm not a coach. I'm not involved in the association. I was the first board member 11 years ago when we were still playing there. So I go to Guilford's office today. He's like, oh, AYSA plays on that field? I didn't know that. What? The director of public works doesn't know that the Amherst Youth Soccer Association plays on the Fort River grass to the right as you drive in? Are you kidding me? That's the state of the system. I like Guilford. He's a nice guy. He listened. He agreed. He supported. He said, we had no money. Money, money, money. I'm telling you, I got 50 parents, 100 parents will come do the work. Just give us the license to get on the fields. Some of us are professional grade landscapers and some of us know professional grade landscapers. With due respect to the people who own that shed across the street from the high school field, they are not professional grade landscapers and they're not doing their work. Okay, last moment. Okay, we'll, we'll close uh, public comments. I'm assuming there are no announcements that came to anyone on the committee. Uh, I'd like to, we, as we discussed at the beginning of the meeting. Yes. Sorry to interrupt, but I'm yes. just wondering if we're going to approve minutes for. I was going to do that after the. Uh, I, was, I literally was going to move the superintendent update and then go to the approval minutes, follow the order of the agenda immediately afterwards. Um, so. Uh, I'd like to open up the superintendent's update, obviously particularly about this. Assuming we're going to talk about this issue in particular. Yep. 
I'll start with that. And there's a, for people who are in the public, there's a, did a memo to the school committee. It's about three pages long in the back. So I'm not literally going to read the whole thing, but um, people want to follow along. So the first thing is not in the memo, which I want to start from the place of appreciating people who came in to advocate on this issue. Uh, I want to acknowledge that it's a very real issue for our students. And um, I come at this both professionally in my role, but also personally. I was thinking about this last night. The for only time I was connected to a school, I grew up in a different state, so a school board um, or school committee, <coughs> other than my current role, was as a 16-year-old coming to advocate on very much similar issue to what I heard tonight, uh, particularly to an asphalt track that we felt like was um, insufficient to support student needs um, and student health. So I do really appreciate people coming out and sharing their opinion, and I want to share in some of their frustration of where we are. Um, just for context, this is not a new issue. This is an issue that's been um, being discussed for the last several years. Uh, a couple things that we, the district did, knowing that this was an ongoing issue, um, two things in particular, were that we requested for athletic field study to be completed. Uh, the town of Amherst joined us in that. And so that was two years ago, that around this time of year when we're doing budget, to identify the sources of the problems, understand the drainage problems, and develop long-term solutions. And the second was in the last three years, and you all know uh, as well as anyone, how challenging the budgets have been over the last three years. We've budgeted $130,000 to start saving in, in a stabilization fund, so when we actually have a project to complete, we have some savings in there to get started with. I'm not at all saying that $130,000 will replace fields with a turf field, as people have mentioned, but it was uh, trying to scrape away funds where we could to get started on this issue, because we knew it was coming up, we know it's an issue, and we know our Four towns are um, struggling in terms of the finances, so we were trying to do our, our part of looking at the operational budget and actually building in some capital stabilization in there. Um, I think as was referenced earlier, the, uh, for people who aren't aware, the way the relationship historically worked is the Amherst DPW, Department of Public Works, takes care of all the fields in the schools, and we support them with what the requests are for funding. Um, and that's been the, as, as long as I've been in the district, that's been the relationship between the, the schools and the town and the maintenance of the fields. We do have some of our maintenance staff does come in and help out when there's particular situations, uh, which I'll get into in a minute. I'll give a tangible example of that. But in general, that's been um, the relationship between the schools, the town, um, and the district around field maintenance. Um, this spring has been very challenging. I wrote a summary mostly coming from Ross Beck, who's our trainer, was in the role of acting athletic director actually, until today. Mr. Farrell came back from his leave. There's also on the third page a statement from Alan Snow, who's the director of Trees and Grounds, who is an employee of the town who is most directly connected to maintenance of the fields. The long and the short of uh, both of these, because I'm not going to read them uh, the full length of them aloud, is that April was one of the wettest Aprils that we've had on record in New England and created unique challenges for a community that already has drainage issues on all of its fields. And one of the challenges that we face as a community, not just as a school district, is, the, is that wetness. So for instance, Plum Brook, which was, I know that's a kind of a topic that has had a lot of consternation in the community, so I'm so we're loath to bring it up, but I think it's relevant for this discussion. Um, there was an attempt to fix the drainage problems, I'm not gonna go into the details, and yet for much of the month of April, that wasn't a viable site for either youth sports or for moving uh, our sports at the high school and middle school to alternate fields to give our fields more of a break. So we do have a challenge in our community based on the wetness of where the fields are and what happened this spring. In terms of the ultimate tournament, um, you can see a description of that. Um, there was more rain Sunday than what was forecast. It was intended, uh, the forecast was to end in the late morning. That didn't happen. Um, and unfortunately, the tent rental company drove a truck onto the girls' field, uh, even despite being not told, to, told not to do so. We did communicate with that company uh, and follow up with them. Uh, and this is where our maintenance staff tried to do as many repairs as we could uh, to the damage done, not just by the student athletes from, that come from all across the country, but from the truck, which created significant damage on the field that was, frankly, more challenging to fix than some of the other damage that occurred. This spring, we entered in an initial agreement with UMass uh, to host our games that happened after their students were gone. They're much more willing to work with us when their student athletes are not present and vying for the same fields that we might be vying for. And at the end of this season, both the boys and girls lacrosse teams will each have hosted three contests on the turf at UMass, and the senior night is for both will be held 
uh, on the turf. So we've tried to make the best, the district has tried to make the best of the situation this spring. But I think rightfully, many of the comments you heard tonight were not actually about this spring, because that season is mostly finished. It's about the fall and how we're going to get to the uh, next steps for fall. So I think there's two things at play. Uh, one is, how are we starting to plan for fall? And then what are the long-term plans? So I'll do it in that order, because I think concurrently, as was noted, uh, we need to improve the situation now, as well as have a long-range plan for improving the situation more, I won't say permanently, but less temporally. So uh, in terms of planning for fall athletic director Rich Farrell, he'll be back here two weeks from now. He's meeting with the town DPW staff to try to identify a plan for late spring and summer field maintenance because uh, you don't make those, you can't figure that out in the last two weeks of August actually. The work starts now in terms of both the maintenance and use of this, those fields. And so he'll be back, he'll be here on June 11th, the next meeting, to share in more detail what that plan is. I think one of the things that everyone shares with me, it's worth noting that the plan's only as good as the weather. So if the weather continues to be wet, a certain plan will be in place. If the weather gets bone dry and we get closer to drought conditions, like we had, I want to say it was two years ago, then you have to adjust that plan. And, and that creates uh, a challenge for the staff, but that's what they're trying to work on. What are the plans if it's wet? What are the plans if it's dry? And how do we maintain the fields in a different way so that we don't repeat these cycles um, that we've been under? Uh, I wanted to express that a number of community members have reached out to me uh, directly, and I'm not speaking specifically to this evening, of uh, being willing to volunteer and help for the fields, and that is certainly something that can be done. Um, there's examples, we have positive examples where nonprofit organizations such as the Amherst Baseball work to support the DPW in their work. And the DPW appreciated the person power and the volunteers to in improve the fields. And that's certainly something that from the district end we're, we're open to and interested in. And, and talking to Mr. Mooring from the DPW end, they also would be interested in uh, having that. We just want to make sure we have the right structure and a plan is laid out so that the volunteer hours go towards improving the field and the overall, an overall plan instead of patching individual challenges. Um, from our vantage point, it's not our staff, but uh, we've been able to work around you know, any union contract issues because we've had successful partnerships in the past, so it has not been a barrier um, in the past. I think, um, I think I'll just mention one more thing on the planning for fall because we'll do more, a more complete update with Mr. Farrow two weeks from tonight. But I think the closing fields piece is things that we've done. I think one of the challenges that we've had in this particular community is that where do the students go to? That the fields over at the university and the colleges are used all the time. They actually, some of the intramural teams rent our fields as in poor condition as they are because they don't have space for all the fields and all the varsity athletics of both genders and intramurals for both genders at the universities and colleges. So it is a real challenge um, for us when some of the community fields are in similar condition as the school fields. And that's really some of the thinking that Mr. Farrow has to do and will do with the DPW. If we do need to close the field, where do practices happen? Where do games happen? And where are there fields that are maintained well enough where we don't take a two week break from a sport? Yeah, and this will really segue into some of the long term work, which is a turf field won't solve all the problems that one turf field won't satisfy all the athletic teams that we have uh, in the fall or spring seasons. So we have to get both work on the long-term solutions, but also work to know that one turf field does not resolve the field conditions for all of our inter-collegiate, inter or inter, excuse me, inter-school sports uh, student athletes. So I wanna talk about long-term, then I can open up for questions for the committee. And I apologize, we'll be in more detail in two weeks from now. So. Uh, I think you all have worked with me long enough and kept in a former life, right? We worked together uh, in my old role to know I rarely express frustration in public meetings, just not typically how I respond to things. But I do want to publicly say I'm incredibly frustrated that we are not looking at a completed uh, athletic field study today, that the, you all had a, two presentations, but one was back in October with a public presentation. And the fact that we asked for this two years ago and we're not in the place of having a completed study um, really hampers our ability to organize you for the school committee to say, yeah, what makes sense? What are things that we would want to um, work towards so that, that the community can then gather, su gather support and actually work towards long-term solutions? I've communicated my frustration to the chair of that committee who's working on that. Um, I've offered my support of making, sharing that frustration with 
uh, consultants, um, and hopefully they will resolve things quickly. Do have a meeting on Thursday, as Mr. Sullivan hopefully knows. I think that was communicated out. No. I, okay. I was I told that you would have a meeting on Thursday. I'm not part of the recreation working group, so I uh, hopefully that's in your email. But that's I what will, I was. I will be there. Yeah, uh, that's what was relayed to me. I'll put it that way. And so the challenge is the, the report's not going to have all the answers, but it's going to identify a number of the problems in more detail than what we have now. And it's also going to identify a number of potential solutions that the community and you all and, and staff can respond to so that we can work together of what do we want to bring to the community. There's many people who said, I want to start fundraising. And the challenge is fundraising for what? Any kind of fundraising effort has to have a really clear objective and outcome before it really can take hold. So it is holding us up. I'm doing everything under my power to move this forward. Um, I'm not going to stay on this longer because I think I've already expressed my feelings on it. I could go on, but uh, I don't think that's productive. Uh, once that report's finalized, you all need to see it and gather feedback from the community, from staff, from coaches, uh, about what may make the most sense because you all understand the fiscal reality of our four towns as well. And um, I think that's the next step on the long-term piece that needs to happen. And, um, you know, I say at the end of this that, in my opinion, it's likely that both public funds and private fundraising will need to contribute to a final product. So both the school committee and the community need time to marinate over what do we think the community needs, what can the community support, and that conversation is not an immediate conversation. I really want to um, suggest, and my frustration comes from not being able to get that going. Um, and then we get to summer, and momentum is really challenging to build over summer months in the larger community. I don't mean just the school committee, but it's just people are, um, the ability to attend to major projects over the summer for the larger community. We, you know, every time we do public engagements in the summer, our, our attendance is lower, and, and that's a real challenge. So uh, what I will come back with two weeks from now is Mr. Farrow will share about his plan for the kind of interim plan, interim time period of getting ready for fall. And I'd like for whether it's Mr. Sullivan, Mr. Mangano, or someone on the, the recreation working group to come and present where that group is and um, so, so we can plot out both timelines, both the interim plan and then the long-term uh, plan, because I think that's what's required for the condition of the fields that we have. Sorry, it was a little disjointed tonight. I'm not, I apologize, I wasn't, I am not feeling uh, so well, but I wanted to at least communicate a summary of what was in writing. Right, so this was, this is on the agenda, as we typically know, uh, under the superintendent's update. Um, typically, as you well know, committee members will ask questions or make comments for the feedback of the superintendent. He's mentioned that he thinks that this is going to be, if you know, yeah. that you think, that this will be an item at the next regional school committee meeting. So um, knowing that we we want to both, I think, have the discussion we need to have, but also then do it in a timely way that feeds into the next meeting, I'd love to open up uh, for any questions, uh, particularly clarifying questions and then comments or feedback back to the superintendent, uh, Mr. Fonch, and then Mr. Donald. Are we allowed comments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as a former coach here, um, I can sympathize with, um, sorry. As a former coach here, I can sympathize with the coaches and players in the audience and understand the importance of what they're talking about. But for me, uh, what leaps out um, in, in no uncertainty are the issues of sa safety and equity. These are matters, particularly equity, that Amherst um, toots its own horn. And I think on this one, we need to, if we're going to walk the walk, we need to talk the talk. And it's long overdue to address the issue of fields. It's not just a high water level. Um, they've been seriously, um, uh, what's the word I want to use, injured, I suppose, <laughs> over the last decade. And it's really time to step up and deal with the matter. And I'm, when I read this report, Michael, um, I, I, it's, great, it's great. And you're, you're backing this up is fine. And I understand where you are as superintendent. What I have trouble with is I'm reading here that it's taken two years for this report. What's up with that? And what can we do as a school committee to say, hey, it's time to put up this report because kids' health and safety is at risk. What can we do to do that? So I think what I can do is communicate that uh, the frustration I have communicated is not shared is shared by the school committee, um, and I'm 
very, I think, um, if the school committee was comfortable with that, I'd be happy to do that. So, Ms. McDonald, Mr. Sullivan, Ms. Adonis. Make sure you pull the microphone up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I was, I'm distracted because I was just thinking about on, on that. But um, I, I, I think um, I, I totally a agree and, and share the perspective of this being as much of an equity issue as a, as a health and safety issue. Um, it, they're, they're completely t entwined. Um, one of the questions that I have, um, though, is so there's the long-term plan, the recreation working group, which is the, the long-term plan, um, and it would be a phased, in, in, you know, in the ideal world, it would be a phased implementation, and funding wouldn't be an issue <laughs> over, over that time, and we all know that that's going to be a long and slow process. Um, so that's, uh, you know, to your point about long-term, but what are we going to do now? Um, and even with that long term, let's say, you know, stars align and we have that perfect funding scenario and, and things go up smoothly all the way, we still have the problem that one of our um, community members raised, which is just baffling to me, that we don't have a mechanism or at least a clear mechanism for managing the usage of the fields. And I think mm -hmm. that that's something that doesn't require a huge capital budget in order to figure out how we do that. And you know, I'm a parent of, of athletes, and I've always wondered how decisions get made about this field or that field, and they play multiple sports, and right. you know, one kid's game is canceled, and we drive by and we see another team actually practicing on the field that we were supposed to be on. So it, it's, it is baffling to me that we don't have and I, I have some sort of central clearinghouse that makes those decisions and balances the needs of both the local youth sports teams that are, independ that are independent organizations, town-run um, camps and, and clinics, and school sports. There, there seems to be a need. I don't know that it's the district that should be sort of leading that, but we should definitely be asking for that because those fields impact all of our kids. Um, and so I think that there's some other, the other comment about sort of the maintenance also, which I hope that um, Mr. Farrell will be talking about when he comes here in two weeks. Because again, that's a short-term, mid-term, long-term issue that needs to be tackled, that sort of waiting until we have these fabulous new fields is not going to solve the problem. Because we still, even with those fabulous new fields, we'll need to figure out how we're going to be maintaining it. So I'd love to know, um, and maybe not tonight, maybe not answering that tonight, but it, maybe when we come back to it in two weeks that we talk about sort of the governance and how we can centralize that and make that work better for everybody. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So for, I'd like to answer Mr. Fonch's <coughs> question first. The, um, the fields committee, we were two years ago, we were supposed to meet for one year and then we were all released and then re-enlisted for another year. And then we, the members themselves, we were released in February, I believe it was, when the presentation was given here. And now it sounds like we're being re-enlisted tomorrow or Thursday. So I'm not, I'm not sure where the holdup was, but it, it wasn't with the actual committee. And as far as the, um, that, speaking to the varsity field in the middle of the soccer field, three years, I'm just saying make sure you have Okay. Three years ago, Mr. Farrow and the DPW set out to really try and revive that field, and they core aerated it at least twice. They overseeded it. They were watering it. And then the following summer was the drought. So the field became hard as a rock. The grass, you know, just about died, turned brown. And then this, you know, they, and they kept, except for senior night, Last year, there was only two games played on that field. And then last fall, it started to rain. It hasn't stopped yet. And <laughs> so that just it has destroyed that field. And it is a giant sponge. But they really did. They, they tried. And the weather just hasn't cooperated. They even had fire hoses out there that summer of the drought to try and get the grass to grow. And then one other thing is as a dad of a female athlete that played in the middle school and in the high school, it was, I had to ask a question early in um, my daughter's seventh grade 
because she would drive by and watch the boys' baseball field be worked on, and the softball field at the far end looked like it was being just ignored. And I had to ask a lot of questions and find out that it really is. It's the, it's the baseball leagues that help get the baseball field to the shape that it's in. And so I've learned that every, every new seventh grade set of girls needs to be educated to the fact that it really is. It's the um, baseball leagues that do help with that baseball field. And we, every time that something comes up, I do, like the boys' locker room was repaired first, even though both were leaking. It just happened to be leaking worse. And this spring, they've redone the girls' locker room in this high school. And same thing with the baseball and the softball field over in the middle school. They chose because the balls seemed to hit the parking lot from the boys' baseball field first, but the girls' backstop is also on the docket to be replaced. Thank you. Mr. Dennis? Um, I find what uh, I think what Mr. Sullivan has said to be, and, and what another community member said earlier, just about the impact on uh, the perception and the reality of girls uh, that are experiencing the fields differently than the boys are, to be particularly egregious. Um, I think that you know if we can name it, we should be fixing it. There's something there that should be done about this. Um, I've expressed my frustration to the superintendent previously about the you know, town not doing, I suppose, what they should be doing in terms of maintenance. And I will say this publicly <laughs> as well, because I think that this is an, something that is impacting our students. And we've had numerous conversations on this committee around the safety of these fields and the impact on our students. Uh, it absolutely 100% is an equity issue. And I also think that, um, you know, we, if there are things that we should be doing as a school committee to help move this along, I would love to hear what that is. Um, <clears throat> we have been waiting for a very long time for this report. Um, it's also one of those things where it feels like sometimes we're putting out so many different fires, you know, uh, metaphorically speaking, that until something like this flares up, that, you know, it just kind of falls by the wayside, right? And, and you know, the town, the, this committee, none of us are sort of paying attention to it the way that we should. And that's really unfortunate. Um, I've also raised, I think, to the superintendent other issues regarding maintenance around the high school uh, in the past. Um, it really just, I think, strikes me that there isn't someone or some ones that are constantly looking to see if there are things that can be fixed or that should be fixed or addressed before they become a crisis, right? And so what can we do to put those, those measures in place uh, to make sure that it doesn't reach a crisis point. I think that's the conversation that we should be having on this committee. Like, you know, what are the, the, uh, the things that, that need to happen in advance? Um, and, you know, if it's conversations that we should be having with the town, great, we should do that. If it's, you know, conversations that we should be having internally in our dis district staff, you know, let's, let's see if we can make that happen. If it's budget-related items that we can be doing to ensure that regular maintenance is taking place. If we don't have the staff for it, you know, do we find additional money to help pay for additional staff, equipment, whatever it is? But we can't just keep ignoring this kind of a problem, right? Um, and these are problems that clearly have preceded this current administration, this current committee, but we, you know, it seems like that always keeps happening, right? It's the problems that just keep proceeding, that keep, you know, sort of getting grandfathered in, and then nothing really happens. So. I'm hopeful that at this point um, it's becoming enough of a of a concern for enough community members and for this committee and for this you know and for for you too, Dr. Morris, yeah. um, where we will take urgent action on something like this because it's not okay for us to just continue in the same pattern over and over again. The fields are not going to get better, and I think as Ms. McDonald stated, uh, you know, waiting for that perfect field to, to materialize, right? The money, you know, obviously these are millions of dollars that we're talking about in redoing these fields. But at the same time, we can't just ignore the fields until that money comes to us, right? So what can we do uh, to ensure that there are measures put in place before we hit the next crisis point? And what can we do now to help mitigate some of these effects? 
Um, how can we advocate? You know, who do we need to talk to? What? How do we continue to raise this as an urgent issue that need, that should be addressed as soon as possible? Um, we cannot allow this to continue. Ms. Spitzer. Thank you. Um, I just want to echo everybody's frustration here, but also kind of look forward to some solutions. And I think one of the things that I'm most concerned with is to say in a couple of years we do get these new fields. If we don't have the infrastructure and the planning and the coordination in place, we're going to end up in the same position in just a few years. Um, you know, and, and clearly it's not one thing. It's uh, maintenance, it's weather, it's, it's, it's everything. But it seems like the things we could do now in terms of creating, an, and this isn't something for the committee to do, but for the community to do, like creating a nonprofit, com creating the infrastructure for fundraising, or things that can start now before we even have fields in place, or maybe even before we have a plan in place. So um, I also just, I feel like there's coordination between the town, between the region, and then I'm also thinking about the, the schools here, um, UMass and Amherst College. It seems like We've been talking on this committee about relationships between UMass um, and the t t excuse me and this town and also the school system in terms of you know the the Donahue report and things like that and this almost seems like more pressing to me is because if we're relying on some of their fields and they're relying on some of our fields it's it, there just must be ways that we can coordinate better and maybe leverage some of the resources they have to help us even more in the immediate term because it's going to be a couple of years so um i'm happy to lend my support to any of these efforts so thank you so um yeah go ahead ask a question you may i wanted to make a i wanted to make my own comments oh i'm sorry I, go ahead no, no, go, no ahead. go ahead um just that i recall uh years ago there was a 10 i think sean put together a 10-year capital fund plan does that still exist yes and I can have that. And we went over it, but I know you're, you're back in the committee. You guys I can, are on it. Yeah, and I will. Uh, I'll send that to the committee um, tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So um, I mean, I have a, I have a couple thoughts that I'm echoing a lot of what what has been said by the members of the committee. Then I have a, um, for quite a while. I've actually. I mean, this is kind of a funny comment. I really appreciate the work of sort of booster clubs and foundations and things like that. But I didn't actually know how the baseball field was maintained. And I actually thought it was because it was the town's field and not the region's field. And so like the town took care of it because it was the town's field and the region had to figure out how to do it. And I actually thought it was like a management issue. Like, you know, we don't know who's taking responsibility for certain fields. So that's not the case. Apparently it's because there's a good booster club. I, you know, I have to admit, I'm, I've been troubled by this for years. And I remember when I was going to grad school out in California, where there's a really fragmented low public school system out there, you have really radical differences between the school districts on the level of resources they have, because some communities are rich. And the rich communities invest in themselves, and they, they raise private funds, and they invest in really beautiful fields and really beautiful libraries. And next door, you have a, a town that may not be poor, but they just, they're just a working class community. They don't have the resources to do that. And you go to the schools, and they don't have those fields. They don't know those things, right? So there's so the the challenge is if the schools are replicating the inequity that exists in society as a whole. So baseball is really popular. I love baseball. I, I sucked at it as a kid, so I couldn't play it, but I loved it. Still love it. Um, it's a really popular sport in this country. You can probably raise a lot of money supporting baseball. Um, probably there are other supports, other sports that. Maybe people who you're passionate about, but they're less popular in a way that can attract lots of dollars, right? So does it make any sense? And, I, and by the way, you could replicate this with a variety of other electives and programs you have in school. Does it make sense to actually have the quality of your facilities and programs based on whether or not people self-organize and raise money? And if you don't do, and by the way, all of the offers for help are appreciated and someone, I'm sure, will work with you to take you up on those offers. So I'm not saying you shouldn't donate. I'm not saying you shouldn't volunteer. I think that's great. But I'm, I'm really deeply troubled about the idea that we would have um, inequity in the quality of our fields because um, some group just hasn't gotten the attention or it's not popular enough or maybe the families who are playing it don't have as much money as the other families that do, right, who play some other sport. And that's, that's offensive. 
however, tracks. And I think it's the job of our schools <laughs> to try to figure out where are those areas where there are gaps to fill, where public resources, in addition to any raise from the public, public resources have to provide a baseline of equity and, and access and quality at a minimum. And obviously, and so I'm just saying that as a blanket thing, and, and just as a, on a different committee with different buildings that we have in the same corporate district jurisdiction, when we found that we had issues of cleanliness and of maintenance, um, we decided to come up with a plan for it, right? And it was so there was a long range plan to replace some buildings that were considered to be outdated. There was, which is mirrors this notion of having uh, a, field, a new field study and a new plan. There was also the immediate request to understand, do we need more resources? Like marginally, would an extra 30 or 50,000 bucks or whatever the amount is make a difference in terms of staffing to improve that? The, the, in that case, it was whether the schools had mice in them or not and were clean, right? In this case, it's whether they, um, there's a good management plan in place for the use of the fields and um, are they being maintained at a minimum level in which they're safe for the, for the students who are using them and other people who are using them? And so to me, it's, you, we, there, it's utterly, I mean, to me, it would be utterly irresponsible of us as a committee if we didn't ask you to come back um, with some response around whether or not there are any immediate resource needs. I recognize it's not a million dollars, it's not a ton, you know. But right. so where, where we can, what do we need to do to get a better handle on the, the management and the safety of the fields? And in particular, when we think of safety, we can't, it's not acceptable. You know, that's why I'm mirroring that other situation. Because in another situation, um, people on a, that other school committee immediately said, including me, because right. I was on it, <laughs> immediately said, we need a plan, we need to know what the response is, we need to know who's in charge, who's going to be following this thing, we need follow-up reports on it. Um, and I don't see how this is any different in that regard. Particularly, this goes back to something Mr. Donald was saying, particularly on the issue of safety. We can't go in to September and October wondering whether the fields are going to be, uh, accidents happen, right? But they shouldn't happen if people are navigating terrain, which is itself by its definition um, unduly challenging, right, or unsafe. So we gotta get a better handle on that. I also think that we need to understand um, how, do we, how are we making decisions and what are the policies in place or practices in place around who's utilizing the fields and when? Uh, and is there a hierarchy of who's allowed to use the fields and not? And I mean, meaning, and, and I'm, op I'm personally saying, since I don't know this, I want to be open to what you tell us, what we learn, because I'm not trying to say, for example, there shouldn't be a lacrosse camp this summer. Um, but my, my immediate thought is when you hear, and I don't even know what the camp is, whether it's a nonprofit or a local part of the schools or not. But when, I, when you hear about different groups and organizations utilizing fields that then break down their ability to recover, then your immediate thought is, well, do we need to manage them differently or can we actually have all these organizations utilizing these fields or not? Or if they are, are they paying into any sort of recharge fund that goes back into resodding it and, and doing the other kinds of right. aerating and seeding that needs to happen? Uh, and who's accountable and responsible for that? Who's on point for these things? And so what, what I, pardon me for going on about this, I'm gonna stop. But um, my point is that for, for and it, it, this is gonna be, I recognize this is challenging. It's challenging for the town, it's challenging for you, it's challenging for uh, Mr. Farrow. But, um, but whether, whether we have this at the next meeting or a combination of the June 11th and June 25th meetings, I think, I think what I would be more satisfied knowing, and I think this echoes what we're hearing from everyone else on the committee, is understanding you know, very specifically, let's just open this up, because also I really don't want people in the public, um, parents and others, guardians and others, worrying, you know, and wondering what's going to happen between now and the <coughs> fall to make sure these fields right. are safe. So I think a, a high level of transparency, like, again, analogous right. to what we did in that other situation, right. um, is what we really need here. Yeah. And so, um, we, you know, I think that if, if the members of the committee want to give you other feedback, off, offline individually as you're preparing for the next one, that'd be fine. But I just think we, we need to chunk out what, we're, what we'd like to understand around how the fields are existing managed uh, and uh, how they're being maintained. Um, are there existing needs that need to be better filled? And then that goes all up to soup the nuts to the question of how do we engage 
um, volunteer actors and others. But um, but being part of the nuts and bolts of this thing is I I would I would be very upset if we didn't find out in a literal practical right. sense how are these things going to be managed going into next September or October because it'd be a pox. I mean I hate to say this, but I'm saying it publicly and I will a pox on us if we don't investigate that, right. and then come September, we find out we're in the same boat we're in before. Right. I'd rather be in at least a new boat, not the <laughs> same one. Right. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Sorry to be hard on you. I don't think, I don't perceive it that way. All right. We're gonna need a new boat. Huh? We're gonna need a new boat. We may need a new, if it's this <laughs> wet, <laughs> yeah, weather aside, um, we may need it. Um, any other questions or comments? Or those who wanna, wanna move on, I, I realize we're taking a significant time, but it's important to people. <coughs> okay, anything else you wanted to say? I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Uh, do you have anything else in your update? Um, I'm just... Or you want to wait? We're 30 minutes behind schedule, so I'm just conscious that there's both public and staff who are here to do other things. So maybe I'm at the fine. end if we have time, but thank I you. I am fine. There's a lot of good news in the your other update. Your desire to defer is perfectly acceptable. Yeah. Um, so the next order of business back onto the uh, regular agenda is approval of the minutes of May 14th, 2019. Um, the committee's had a chance to look at the minutes or not and have any potential. Yes, Mr. Marshall. Um, yeah, um, I, I mentioned in the attendance twice, and the second person is going to be the twin brother, so that should be stricken from the minutes. <laughs> ah, there you go. Okay. Uh, any, any further edits people have found? Otherwise, I'd entertain a motion to approve. Yes. I move to approve the minutes of Tuesday, May 14th, as presented. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, any further amendment, any further discussion of the item? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes? Of May th yes. I think the motion should be approved as amended. Did you say that? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You're right. You said it pre presented. As presented, yeah. So I can amend my motion. Why don't you amend your motion? Okay, so I would like to amend my motion uh, to approve the minutes of Tuesday, May 14th as uh, corrected. Which will get rid of the second font. Getting rid of the uh, second font. Is the seconder, is it amenable to the seconder? Second. It is amenable to the seconder. <laughs> uh, any further discussion saying none, all those in favor? Say aye. It carries unanimously with um, one, two, three, four, five, six votes. Okay, uh, subcommittee updates. Are there any subcommittee updates today? There appear to be none, and we'll move forward. Um, so on the, on, the, on the chair's report, I just wanted to, you have a letter that's been shared with you that's somewhere in my packet um, from Amherst Media, and uh, I, I, the first, the, what the letter does is the letter requests um, a dialogue or consultation with the regional school committee um, about uh, as a potential alternative of whether Amherst Regional High School might be able to incorporate Amherst Media as a self-contained facility uh, within the high school building uh, and grounds. Uh, and um, people, uh, the committee should be aware that um, there's been uh, some initial outreach that's occurred uh, to the superintendent uh, and to the committee's liaison to Amherst Media. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the thing that's really helpful, I think, in this regard is that the um, facilities use study that was uh, recently completed um, gave uh, the district a really good view of um, how we're currently using our space, if we have potential excess space. Uh